Hey guys, welcome back to the next lecture. In this one, we're going to talk thyroid nodules, thyroid cancer, thyroid storm, and hypothyroidism. So let's dive in and let's start with thyroid nodules. Now, we touched on this briefly in the hyperthyroidism lecture when we talked about the toxic adenoma and the toxic multinodular goiter. So you either palpate a suspected nodule during the neck exam, or you see a suspected nodule incidentally on CT or while performing an ultrasound of the carotids or some other imaging study. Now, at that point, the next best step is to order TSH and perform an ultrasound of the thyroid. Those are jointly the next best step. Now, they shouldn't really ask you on the exam to distinguish between these two because they're listed together in the guidelines. Now, if TSH is normal or elevated, this means the nodule is cold, meaning non-functioning and therefore a fine needle aspiration, FNA, must be performed if certain criteria are met. For example, if imaging shows that the nodule has some features of malignancy, if the size is greater than one centimeter, those are a couple big indicators. Now, if ultrasound doesn't show us features that warrant an FNA, then what we're going to do is monitor it via ultrasound. Now, just to avoid any confusion, here's the steps in order that you are going to follow. You can review this uh, as a refresher, but this is the current guidelines for how to approach a thyroid nodule. I'm not going to walk you through it here, but be sure to refer back to this. Typically, remember, though, for your CK, just know the next best step, all right? This is not uh, your internal medicine rotation, uh, your internal medicine shop board exam. So, you know, you don't have to know this in super duper detail. Just know your next best step. All right, let's briefly go over the high yield points associated with thyroid cancer. Again, we touched on this in great detail in step one. So we're not going to go into the, the crazy details here, but we do need to refresh ourselves so that we at least can recognize what's going on. So sometimes patients are asymptomatic and they're found to have thyroid cancer following an FNA for a suspicious thyroid nodule. Other times patients present with symptoms of hoarseness, ipsilater ipsilateral uh, cervical lymphadenopathy, rapid nodular growth, as well as a nodule that's fixed and attached to adjacent tissues that could be felt on the thyroid exam. Now, there's four main types of thyroid cancer you need to be aware of for this exam. The first is the papillary thyroid cancer. This is the most common form of thyroid cancer. Now, on histology, there's a very characteristic finding known as the orphan antiis. These are nuclei that have intranuclear cytoplasmic inclusions. Then we have the follicular thyroid cancer. This is the second most common type of thyroid cancer. This one's associated with that RAS mutation. Then we have anaplastic thyroid cancer. This is going to be your worst type. It has a very poor prognosis, and oftentimes you will get palliative care right away in these cases. Now, patients will often present with a rapidly enlarging neck mass with that type of, of uh, thyroid cancer. Now, the last one here we have is the medullary thyroid cancer, and this is a cancer that's strongly associated with a RET gene mutation as well as MEN2. So this is a neuroendocrine tumor that's made up of parafollicular C cells. Therefore, it may synthesize calcitonin. All right, let's move on now to the thyroid storm. This is a very serious life-threatening condition. And patients at risk for the development of a thyroid storm include those who are untreated and have hyperthyroidism, those with bodies that are under some sort of stressor. That could be trauma, surgery, uh, birth, infections, whatever it may be. Also, certain iodine-containing drugs like amiodarone or contrast-containing iodine can really throw a patient into this thyroid storm. Now, when it comes to the signs and symptoms, a very high fever, which could be as high as 104 to 106, is commonly seen. Now, patients will be tachycardic. They may or may not have an arrhythmia, and the heart can go into heart failure as a result of this rapid heart rate or if there's a presence of an arrhythmia. Now, as a result of this, you can have subsequent cardiovascular collapse with severe hypotension. Patients usually also have altered mental status and may even go into a coma. A goiter may or may not be present. Now, the labs that you want to see here include low TSH, as well as an elevated free T4 and or T3. You also want to look for hyperglycemia, hypercalcemia. The white blood cell count can be high, can be low, so that's not hugely telling. Um, and lastly, you might see elevated levels of ALT and or AST. Now, interestingly, the free T4 and or T3 levels are usually not any higher than you would normally see in your typical hyperthyroidism case. So don't think because you don't see this hugely elevated free T4 or T3 that it can't be a thyroid storm, right? You want to look for the other important risk factors, signs and symptoms in labs that will help you to identify this. Now, there's no set criteria that really need to be met in order to make this diagnosis. You really just need to make this 
diagnosis clinically based on the presence of, of course, hyperthyroidism, plus some of those severe life-threatening symptoms that I mentioned, altered mental status, coma, cardiac dysfunction. Um, if you remember those, as well as that very high fever, then you're going to easily be able to identify this. Okay. Now, in terms of treatment, there's a slew of medications that are aimed at treating symptoms, right? We want to block new hormone synthesis. We want to prevent peripheral conversion of T4 to T3. Now, when it comes to the cardiac effects, countering those like tachycardia the arrhythmias, a beta blocker is effective. PTU is going to be given to prevent new hormone from being synthesized, while iodine is administered at least one hour after PTU with the goal of preventing the iodine from being used to make new thyroid hormone. After one hour, PTU will start to take effect and iodine solution will block the release of thyroid hormone. Another important uh, part of your treatment protocol is giving iodinated radio contrast agents. We give this to lessen the peripheral conversion of T4 into T3. We can also give glucocorticoids uh, to lessen the peripheral conversion of T4 to T3. And if you have a patient that has Graves' disease, it actually helps to reduce the autoimmune effects of the disease as well. And finally, bile acid sequestrants are used in severe cases with the goal of preventing enterohepatic recycling of thyroid hormones. All right, let's take a look now at hypothyroidism. So there's a lot of symptoms we need to be aware of, but remember, think of these symptoms as just slowing down the metabolism. So fatigue, depression, weight gain, cold intolerance, slowing of cognition, these are all things you should expect to see. Remember, basically just the opposite of what you'd see in hypothyroidism. Now, there's some additional findings you want to really keep your eye open for, like uh, symptoms that affect the hair and the skin. So you might see hair loss, coarsening of the hair, brittle nails. Uh, mixed edema is another thing to look out for. This is non-pitting edema. Um, you also want to look for swelling of specific parts of the body. So look for puffy face, faces. Look for an enlargement of the tongue. Uh, patients can also experience erectile dysfunction. They may experience decreased libido. And females, of course, menstrual irregularities. That doesn't necessarily... Um, it's not necessarily a differentiator, but something to look out for. Now, when it comes to the causes, causes of hypothyroidism include physical or autoimmune destruction of the thyroid gland or damage to the pituitary gland. Now, these conditions can include things like Hashimoto's thyroiditis, thyroidectomy, radio iodine ablation, neck irradiation, iodine deficiency, even Sheehan syndrome. Keep in mind, however, that the most common cause is going to be Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which we'll talk about shortly. Now, when you suspect hypothyroidism, your best initial test is going to be TSH. If serum TSH is normal, no further workups necessary, unless the patient has clinical symptoms of either, either hypo or hyperthyroidism, and you're just really suspicious that this is the cause, uh, or if there's dysfunction of the pituitary or the hypothalamus being suspected, at that point, you can take a look at the free T4. So let's say we get TSH at the beginning and it's elevated. At that point, you wanna perform a free T4 to determine the severity of the hypothyroidism. And like we went over in the hyperthyroidism lecture, if your serum TSH is low, you wanna perform a free T4 and free T3 to determine the severity of the condition. All right, now let's take a look at Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Like I said, the vast majority of hypothyroidism, at least here in the United States, is caused by Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Now this disease predominantly affects women, but it can also affect men. Now, in addition to all the signs and symptoms that we just went over, when it comes to this, you also want to look for something known as Hashimoto's encephalopathy. And this usually looks like an acute onset of confusion and altered mental status. Some people even may progress to comas. Now, other neuro findings aside from AMS can also be seen. This includes things like seizures, myoclonus, and diffuse hyperreflexia. When it comes to labs, hypothyroidism is going to be characterized by high serum TSH and low serum free T4. Um, and if Hash since Hashimoto's is autoimmune, patients have antibodies to thyroglobulin, thyroid peroxidase, as well, uh, antibodies can block the TSH receptor. Now, when it comes to this condition, imaging studies like the thyroid ultrasound or the radioactive iodine uptake are not usually necessary to make our diagnosis. So to make your diagnosis, you want to have all the clinical, all the lab findings consistent with the disease. And these include symptoms of hypothyroidism with the corresponding high uh, high serum TSH, like I mentioned, and a low free T4. As well, you want to find positive TPO and or TG antibodies. Now, the treatment goals here include eliminating the symptoms of hypothyroidism and decreasing the goiter size while avoiding giving too large of a dose that can cause iatrogenic thyrotoxicosis. And we can achieve all of this by titrating the levothyroxine 
which is your, your main med medication, until TSH is actually found to be within normal, normal range. All right, so we don't just throw a bunch of stuff at it. We're going to titrate until we get that TSH within normal limits. Now, if the patient has Hashimoto encephalopathy, in this instance, we will give glucocorticoids as the cause is thought to be antibody immune mediated rather than as an effect of the hypothyroid state. And sometimes patients can have Hashimoto's encephalopathy without actually having hypothyroidism. So that's something important to keep in mind. At this point, we're getting a little confusing though, so I'm not going to um, go too far into that because I don't think you'll get something as confusing. Uh, but if you do have a patient with Hashimoto's encephalopathy without hypothyroidism, in this case, you would just give glucocorticoids, right? But if they're also hypothyroid, remember, we're going to titrate levothyroxine and we will give those glucocorticoids, all right? So just a couple caveats to keep in mind, but still pretty straightforward stuff. All right, let's do some content review questions. Here's your first question. I'll put 20 seconds on the clock. Of course, if you need more time, hit that pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back. Correct answer here is C. Okay, next question. 20 seconds on the clock. If you need more time, hit that pause button, figure it out, and then come on back. correct answer here is A. And we have one more question. I will put 20 seconds on the clock. Once you got it, come on back. Correct answer here is A. All right, and that concludes this lecture. I will see you guys on the next one.